Good morning. <clears throat> you can muster a little bit more enthusiasm than that. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> oh, that sounded so much better. Uh, welcome to uh, our Palm Sunday worship. And uh, we have a very special morning. I don't think we're going to get uh, kids uh, in this service uh, for waving palm branches. Uh, that's going to come at the second service. So uh, anyway, if you would like to wave a palm branch, I actually have no idea where they are. Um, but uh, anyway, welcome, and uh, also a very special part of our worship this morning. Uh, we're going to be uh, commissioning Preston and Abby for missionary service in Guatemala. And uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, I have a Bible somewhere. Oh, here we go. Something that... Uh, I think maybe sometimes misunderstood about the first Palm Sunday when Jesus entered Jerusalem in triumph. Um, we might assume that that was a spontaneous event. It was not. It was very carefully planned and deliberately planned by Jesus. Uh, and one of the prophecies that he was very intentionally fulfilling was from Zechariah 9.9. And uh, we'll, we'll begin our worship this morning with the words of this prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Let's stand together to worship God. Our triumphant King, we come this morning celebrating your presence in our lives, thanking you that it, salvation is in your hands and that it is available to us as we believe and receive the Lord Jesus. We come in his name this morning and ask that you be glorified in all that we do. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Find a prayer of confession print, that's printed in the bulletin. I invite you to join with me. We'll pray aloud together in a moment for a silent personal prayer. Join me in prayer. Eternal God, in Jesus Christ, you have entered Jerusalem to 
die for our sins. We confess that we have not hailed you as king or gone before you in the world with praise. For brief faith that fades in trouble, for enthusiasms that fizzle out, for hopes we parade but do not pursue, have mercy on us. Forgive us, O God, and give us such trust in your power that in every city we may live for your kingdom and tell of your saving love for the sake of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear, hear this promise from the Lord uh, from Romans chapter 5, beginning with verse 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Uh, friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Uh, in Christ, you are forgiven and set free from bondage to sin. And set free to enjoy the glorious liberty of the children of God. You are forgiven, be at peace.
Please be seated and Preston and Abby come on up here uh, to the front. And uh, let's, um, I'm going to have you stand right here so that uh, the people see smile for the camera so the people at home can see you too. Um, Preston and Abby uh, have been, oh, okay. You, you can stay right there. And I'm, suppo I'm supposed to use this one, right? Oh, they're supposed to. That way, that way okay. our, our viewers can also hear this. Aha, <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. okay. Yeah. You know, we haven't practiced any of this. <laughs> Preston and Abby have been preparing now uh, for many, many months, uh, years in fact, uh, to go to Guatemala, uh, where they're going to be ministering uh, through the uh, Seteca Seminary and also uh, the Reforma Iglesia Church. And when do you guys leave? April 1st. April 1st, okay. Coming, coming right up this, this Thursday. Yeah. Yes, okay. And uh, we are also going to do a, a reception for them this afternoon at the Ministry Center on Eustick. Uh, we'll have some goodies and, and you can, uh, I was going to say wish them well, uh, pray them well, uh, and uh, give them a greeting before they take off for Guatemala on Thursday. So pull out from your bulletin, pull out the, this insert that has a responsive reading. And parts of it are for all of you, the congregation, and parts for me, parts for Preston and Abby. Jesus said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Christ promised his disciples that he would be with them always. This applies to those who serve in familiar places and those who travel far. Preston and Abby, please respond to the following questions. Do you believe that Jesus Christ, as he is revealed in the word of God, is the only way of salvation and life for all who believe? We do. God helping us. Do you believe that the Spirit of God has called you to represent Jesus in Guatemala as missionaries of the gospel? We do. We do. God, God helping us. The word of the Lord came to Deborah the prophetess, asking her to defend and protect his people against the enemies that threatened them. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth. For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. And Isaiah replied, Here I am, send me. Mary replied, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to your word. And Peter said, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. Here I am, 
Send me. Brothers and sisters, in baptism, Preston and Abby received the promises of God. In profession of faith, they accepted those promises and pledged to a life of service to Christ. Now they have responded to the call of God to serve in mission. And we're going to pray for Preston and Abby right now. And so Preston and Abby, if you would just kneel right here. And I'm going to ask uh, anybody, uh, uh, just come on up as God prompts you. We need some people to come up and lay hands on them. Yeah, fa- yeah face, face that away. And just come up and put a hand on them as we, as we pray. Would you bow with me? Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you so much uh, for your great call on our lives uh, throughout the the history of of your people Israel Uh, and then into uh, the New Testament and and the time of the birth of the church. You called to yourself people to serve you and all throughout history you have been faithful to raise up leaders uh, for your church. And we thank you uh, that today, we thank you for the call of your Holy Spirit on Preston and Abby. Uh, You've confirmed this call in so many ways, and we thank you for it. And uh, Father, we thank you that you've been preparing the way for them to go to Guatemala. And uh, Lord, that you have prepared for them uh, the acts of service and love uh, that will uh, serve your people there in Guatemala. Uh, So right now we pray uh, that as we lay on hands, even in this moment, Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on Preston and Abby uh, to set them apart, uh, to fill them with your power. Uh, Lord, that that they will minister in in the power and the strength of the Lord. And uh, we will give you all of the glory. And we pray it in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Okay. You can all sit back down. Preston and Abby, go ahead and sit back down. We're going to need that later on. As we uh, go to prayer now, I, I got a chance to speak with uh, uh, Norm Rayburn, uh, Norman Ruthie a little bit yesterday. Um, Norm, uh, as many of you know, has recently been uh, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, he's doing all right. He's got a bunch, a bunch more uh, tests in front of him before they start uh, treatment. Uh, he, he did ask for prayer uh, that uh, he just d- doesn't feel a lot of energy. Uh, he's just tired all the time. And, and so uh, let's pray uh, for Norm for, for his energy level. And uh, as always, uh, if, if you have anybody you want to pray for, for any reason, I'm going to give you the opportunity in the prayer as I prompt you. Uh, just speak their name aloud. Anybody that you want to pray for. The Lord knows the need. So let's, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for your mighty healing power. And uh, we lift up Norm to you and pray your healing for him. Pray you'll give wisdom, uh, guidance to the physicians uh, and the other uh, healing professionals that are working with him. And uh, Lord, that uh, they'll... Uh, come up with a treatment program that will have good healing effect. But Lord, you are the great physician, and we trust, Norm, to you. Uh, We we pray especially, uh, Lord, uh, 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 give him fresh energy and strength uh, that he'll be able to do some of the things that he really wants to do. Father, we thank you uh, on this Palm Sunday as just as the people all those years ago shouted Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. 
we also uh, lift our voices in praise this day to our King Jesus. And I pray for each one here, uh, each, e- each person in this room and, and those watching at home on the live stream. Uh, Father, by your grace and by your Holy Spirit, we bow before our, Jesus as our King. And I pray that the reign of King Jesus would continue to grow in each one of us and extend throughout every part of our lives, that the world would see that there's a difference in us because of Jesus. Uh, Father, we pray today for our brothers and sisters in Christ at the Sterry Evangelical Presbyterian Church out in Roswell, their pastor, Nathan Lewis. Uh, Bless them, we pray. We also pray your healing for Dolores and Josh, Charles, Arabelle, Ira, Diane. Now, if there's anybody you'd like to pray for today, go ahead and and give their name to the Lord right now. Father, we thank you for hearing our prayers, the ones spoken aloud and the ones hidden in our hearts. You know our need before we ask, and so we trust our hearts, our lives to you. In Christ's name, amen. Is somebody going to read? Ah, right here. Sorry. Good morning. My name is Jane Wild. Today's Old Testament reading is Psalms 118, 19 through 29, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we read the scriptures, we listen for your voice. By your spirit, lead us out of our fears and into the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of our souls. Amen. Hear the word of God. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and you have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in his eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we pray, O Lord. O Lord, we pray, give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has made his light to shine upon us. Bind the festal sacrifice with cords up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. O give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. The word of the Lord. We stand. Oh 
couple of things uh, going on in the life of our church uh, that you need to be aware of. Uh, first of all, I mentioned earlier, uh, we're having an open house uh, for uh, Preston and Abby at the Ministry Center uh, this afternoon from 2 to 4, uh, drop in uh, any time uh, during that time. And uh, please do remember uh, to wear a mask uh, and uh, so even, even as you share a greeting uh, with Preston and Abby, even if it sounds like mumbling through your mask, they will know uh, that you are wishing them well and uh, that, uh, uh, that you, they, so come on by and we'll have a few goodies to nibble on there as well. Um, <clears throat> this coming Thursday, is Maundy Thursday. We will be having Maundy Thursday uh, communion right here, 7 p.m. on Thursday. Uh, next Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, really, really important. This service, the first service, is going to start 15 minutes early. We're going to start at 9 a.m. Uh, next Sunday morning. So please remember that. Uh, that's so that we can have a, a longer fellowship time in between. And I'm so pleased to be able to say this. Uh, we're going to have a fellowship time with actual coffee. And uh, yeah, with uh, some goodies to nibble on. It, we're going to be outside. Uh, and even if there's a hurricane, we're going to be out there and we're going to be enjoying it. Uh, so we're going to be outside in the, uh, the covered uh, picnic area right across the parking lot uh, after, right after the first service. Um, and folks from the second, we're going to encourage folks attending the second service to come early and we'll share some fellowship time. And uh, uh, then the second service will be at the normal time next week. But do remember, next Sunday, this first service, 9 a.m. Okay. Uh, then on Sunday, April 11th, we're going to have a congregational meeting at 1030 between the services. It shouldn't take a long time, uh, but we need to elect our uh, pastor search committee uh, as I said, it won't, that, that meeting won't take long, uh, but it'll be between services uh, at uh, 10.30 on April 11th. So, now, if you would open your Bible to Mark's Gospel, I'm going to read Mark's account of the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and then a, a little bit more. So Mark chapter 11, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 14. 
Hear now the Word of God. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethphage and and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever sat. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and found a colt tied (coughs) at a door outside in the street, and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said, and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, when they came from Bethany, Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. This is the word of the Lord. Would you bow with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. This uh, really strange little episode with this rather helpless fig tree. Um, this strange episode comes right after Uh, one of the most exciting moments in the public ministry of Jesus. Uh, Jesus had come into Jerusalem uh, to a hero's welcome. And as I was mentioning earlier, uh, this this event was very carefully planned by Jesus. And he very deliberately rode in on a young donkey, a, a donkey's colt, to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9. Behold, your king comes to you, humble and lowly is he, riding on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And the people are shouting, Hosanna! And they're quoting Psalm 118 um, that that, uh, Jane just read a moment ago. Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Uh, means save us, deliver us. And uh, those people shouting that, when when they were saying to Jesus, save us, deliver us, they're not saying, Jesus, save us from sin, which is what he's going to do. They're saying... What they mean by that shout is deliver us from the Romans. You're our king. You're the promised Messiah. Uh, There was a hope that had been growing in Israel for centuries. And it's a hope that God will once again reign among his people as he did in the times of old. In the days when you know, the days before Israel had a human king, when God led them out of Egypt 
when God led them in the wilderness, when God provided for them manna in the morning, water from a rock, quail to eat. Israel didn't need a king because God was their king. And uh, this yearning had been building for centuries, and particularly because of the oppression of the Roman Empire. And then uh, before that, there was other empires that dominated Israel. They hadn't been free for centuries and centuries. There was a yearning that God would come once again and reign directly over his people. And this excitement really starts to build when Jesus emerges on the scene and he's healing people and he's casting out demons. He's demonstrating the power of God. And Jesus said the the very first words out of his mouth in Mark's gospel, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Now, I, there's, a, there's a confusion, I think, among many modern Christians that sometimes modern Christians hear the term kingdom of God and they think heaven. The kingdom of God is heaven. No, it's not. The kingdom of God is God's kingly reign that has come into the world in the person of Jesus. And remember, Jesus taught us to pray, thy will be done, thy kingdom, or rather thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. Whenever anyone surrenders to King Jesus, whenever anyone bends the knee to King Jesus, the kingdom of God enters in and we become servants of his kingdom here and now. So, but the expectation of these people on the original Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry, Their expectation is that Jesus is going to go directly to the center of power in Jerusalem. And he's going to set up his kingdom. He's going to set up his royal throne. And he's going to reign as God's chosen Messiah in Israel. So there's all this excitement. But instead of going to the center of power in Jerusalem and to clean house and take control, Jesus instead, when the shouting had died down, Jesus went into the city, looked around a little bit, went back out to the little village of Bethany. The very next day, they were walking back into the city without any fanfare this time. And Jesus saw a fig tree with leaves on it. Mark says he was hungry, so he went over to see if there was any fruit. There was none, and Mark makes a point of telling us it was not the season for figs. Okay? And uh, we know that this whole episode takes place during Passover, which would put it on our calendar in late March, early April. And by the way, Jewish Passover began last night at sundown. Uh, Did you notice it was a full moon? Uh, Passover begins on the first full moon following the 14th of Nisan, the Jewish month of Nisan. I know that sounds impressive, but I I actually have no idea when that is. But I do know that it's the first full month after the 14th of Nisan. It began last night. Now, think about this time of year because the annual cycle of 
tree, trees leafing out and, and bearing fruit. It follows just about the same calendar in Israel that it does here. And here we're just starting to see the trees begin to bud out. And uh, Jesus, even though Mark points out it wasn't the season for fruit, Jesus found no fruit. He cursed the tree, saying, May no one eat fruit from you ever again. And Mark later on tells us that they went back and saw that tree the next day, and it was dead. It had withered down to its roots. Now, I'm, I'm feeling just a little bit sorry for this poor little fig tree. Uh, this is not fair. It wasn't the season for figs. So what on earth is, is Jesus doing? Um, well, I can tell you, uh, and you've probably already guessed, uh, that Jesus is not here being a typical man and taking out his frustrations on an inanimate object. Uh, <clears throat> my dad always used to say, there's nothing wrong with anything mechanical that can't be fixed with a hammer. <clears throat> That's not what he's doing. Uh, Jesus is enacting a parable here. And part of it, the sad part of it, is that the fig tree is, is a symbol of Israel. Uh, that Israel will no longer bear fruit for God. There's, there's something new is going to begin. And it's going to, Israel is going to be a part of it, but it's going to expand out beyond that exponentially. But there's also something going on here that applies directly to us. Jesus is acting out a parable to teach us about God's kingdom. Jesus is telling us something that he expects from his ordinary disciples. The kingdom of God that Jesus proclaimed will not come with impressive displays of power in a capital like Jerusalem. In fact, the kingdom is going to come with what looks to the world like weakness. It's going to come through his death on the cross and his resurrection victory. God doesn't work through, and, and Jesus had been teaching this all along, that God doesn't work through what looks to the world like impressive power and uh, political victories and earthly kings, or what, what the world defines as a powerful king. God's kingdom comes through ordinary lives, in ordinary places, when people do extraordinary things, bearing fruit for God, even when it seems like it's not the season for bearing fruit. Even when it seems like the conditions are all wrong. Uh, we are living today, I, I believe, and I don't mean to be uh, discouraging uh, by, by saying this, we're living in a time of spiritual darkness. And people are in the dark about morality and about truth they're confused about politics and religion and the future. Um, and we are actually seeing something in our society today that was prophesied about 40 years ago by a secular author named Christopher Lash. He wrote a book called The Culture of Narcissism. Some of you may remember that book. Um, and what he said was that when people get confused about meaning in life, when people are in the dark and, and have no sense of purpose for life and have no, no larger vision for the meaning of life bigger than themselves, 
Lash said that people will inevitably turn in on themselves. They will be narcissists. And he predicted what he called the culture of narcissism. When people forget God, they turn in on themselves. They care only for themselves. And there are many, I, there are many Christians today, and, and, and maybe I'm one of them from time to time, although I think that this is a, a temptation we need to avoid. Many Christians today fall into the same trap that those people shouting Hosanna at the triumphal entry fell into. That they thought that the solution was for God's Messiah to seize political power and by golly, knock some heads and put things right. Uh, Don't we as Christians today sometimes think that too? The solution to today's problems is we need to get righteous people, we need to get Christians into positions of power. If we could just take over the federal government with the right people, boy, we could set this country straight, right? Hosanna. Deliver us. Save us. If we could just get the right people to grasp the levers of power. And after all, by golly, if anything big is going to happen, it has to happen in Washington, D.C., right? Or in New York or Los Angeles or Seattle. It certainly wouldn't happen in Meridian, Idaho. Well, Jesus, brothers and sisters, went to the cross to die for the sins of Washington and the sins of New York and the sins of Los Angeles and the sins of Meridian, Idaho and Eagle and Star and Boise. And instead of doing something big and spectacular, Jesus asks us to open our hearts and lives to his kingly reign right here, right now, through my life, through your life, to be a light to the communities where we live. He asks us ordinary, he asks us ordinary people to start living as if he were our king. Start bearing fruit for his kingdom with your ordinary life. And start right now, even though it feels like the kingdom hasn't come yet, Jesus was constantly challenging his followers to start living as if his kingdom had come in their lives. Because it has. In Jesus, the kingdom of God is breaking into the world and has been for 2,000 years. And his kingdom is present wherever any heart surrenders to him and says, Lord, use me, the purpose of your kingdom. Start, or rather, stop living for yourself. Stop living the life of the narcissist. Start giving. Care for the sick. Feed the hungry. Love your neighbor. Keep the commandments. Keep your thoughts and actions pure. Share the good news about Jesus. Now, I know these are all good things, and there's nobody here who would ever say 
those are bad ideas. Everybody would say, yep, let's get out there and do those things tomorrow uh, because this is really not the right time. This is not the season and I'm really not quite ready. Uh, I need a lot more training and I need to read a few more books. And uh, after I've read a few more books, then, and, oh, and, and a Bible study. Always need Bible study. And after I've, may, maybe six months from now, after I've, <clears throat> you see what we do? Nobody is going to say, uh, Lord, uh, I can't do that. But we will say, you know, it's just not the season. I'm really kind of busy right now. I'm, I'm going to start living for you, Jesus, at some point in the future, but I'm not ready. It's not the season for me to be bearing fruit. I've got too many problems. I'm not spiritual enough. I need to get my act together first. I got my hands full with my work and my family commitments. And I've got just enough money to get by, so I really can't give any more. Someday. Now, uh, these excuses are all uh, reasonable and realistic. They're just as reasonable and realistic as a fig tree that doesn't have fruit on it in late March. But listen carefully and, and know that I'm preaching to this guy too. If the kingdom of God were only about what we can do, we wouldn't need Jesus. If the kingdom of God is only about what we're capable of doing, we wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. If the kingdom of God is only about my abilities, why would I need God's word to guide me? I wouldn't even, if it was just about me and what I can do, I wouldn't even need faith, would I? I wouldn't need to trust that God is at work in the world and at work in my life. But when Jesus Christ comes into your ordinary life, He rearranges your whole understanding of what's possible. And one of the greatest changes has to do with what you think you're capable of here and now. Jesus Christ always comes into the present moment and calls us to serve Him now, to give ourselves to Him now, to get out on a limb for Him now. The greatest temptation, I think the greatest temptation of the Christian life is not unbelief. Uh, the greatest temptation of the Christian life is, you know, God, I'll, I'll serve you, but the, the time just, just isn't right. Tomorrow. Uh, C.S. Lewis captured this in the screw tape letters. Remember, the screw tape letters is about a senior demon named. Uh, Uncle Screwtape, and he's giving advice to his young nephew, Wormwood, about how to prevent somebody from being a Christian, and then if they do become a Christian, how to make them ineffective. Uncle Screwtape told young Wormwood that he should not try to get a Christian believer to disobey the commands of Jesus. He said, tell him instead, there's no hurry. Tell him there's plenty of time. Uh, it is the devil's most effective temptation. So how do we break out of that? Uh, the answer is right here in, in the text. And I actually didn't read on to, if you, if you kept reading after verse 14, it's the incident of Jesus cleansing the temple. 
Jesus went to the temple and he found, uh, well, he found that they had, uh, they had turned the temple into sort of a first century Walmart. Um, it was a, a business enterprise. Uh, and he drove out the money changers and he drove out the people that were selling animals for the sacrifice. And he said, my house, he quoted from the Old Testament, he quoted from the Psalms, my house shall be called a house of prayer. He was showing us how to bear fruit in every season of life. Prayer is a risky thing. Prayer, we often think of prayer as pleading with God for the things that we want. And when you pray, certainly bring to God the things that are on your heart. There's nothing wrong with that. He's your father. And he knows you and he, he, he loves you. So certainly bring to God the things that are on your heart. But prayer is not primarily about getting what you want from God, e even the things that you desperately want, the healing of a loved one, um, God hears those prayers. But prayer is primarily about surrendering to God and being filled up with God so that we can bear fruit for Him today. Prayer first thing in the morning is about bringing your day to God, re reviewing in, in your head and in your heart your day and praying God, will you use me today to bear fruit for your kingdom? Praying through the people you're going to encounter, and, and there'll be some you know, and some, some will come as a complete, complete surprise to you, but they're not a surprise to God. Every, every person you encounter during the day is a God appointment. Prayer is a matter of a time to be filled up with God so that we can bear fruit for him. And it's a risky thing. We're letting go control of our own lives and handing the reins, handing the steering wheel over to God. Now, Jesus doesn't have to use you if you don't want to make yourself available to his kingdom. He'll find somebody else. But the grace is that he's chosen you and he will use you. If you want the day to bear any fruit for God, then begin it with prayer. Now, is it the season for fruit? Are you ready? Well, let me, let me tell you, based on my own experience, you will never feel ready. I never do. You will never feel ready for what God wants to do through you. In fact, I think one of the ways you can recognize the call of Jesus Christ is that you will instantly say, I'm not ready and I can't do that. But your readiness doesn't matter because he's calling you to do things that can only be done through his power and his Holy Spirit working through you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, don't let us miss our moment. Uh, you come into our lives every day as our king. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of your choosing. Give us a hunger to pray without ceasing that we might be ready every day to serve you, to be a part of bearing fruit for your kingdom. And we pray it uh, in your holy and precious name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
I invite you now to uh, profess your faith along with me. The words of the Apostles' Creed are printed in the bulletin. Would you please stand? Church, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Christ be my leader by night as by day, safe through the darkness for he is the way. Gladly I'll follow my future is Darkness is daylight when Jesus is there. Be my teacher in age as in youth, drifting or doubting, for he is the truth. Grant me to trust him, though shifting as sad. Doubt cannot daunt me, in Jesus I stand. Be my Savior in calm as in strife. Death cannot hold me, for He is the life. Nor darkness, nor doubting, nor sin and its stain can touch my salvation with Jesus. I Okay, uh, today we have a little quiz before you can go. What time is worship, the early service, next Sunday? 9 a.m. 9 a.m. Okay, you all pass. Bless you. Um, and then remember, uh, uh, next Sunday morning we'll have a fellowship time across the parking lot at, between services uh, at, the, at the picnic shelter. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and evermore. Amen. And there is in your bulletin a responsive dismissal. When I forgot to remind you, two to four this afternoon, drop by the ministry center to give a greeting and a, and a we love you. Send off to Preston and Abbey. Um, church, where are you going? We go forth to serve God's world as those who love our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Amen.